Hello, good morning. My name is uh, Adil Patel. I'm a director from Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. I am the, um, my speciality is employment law. We will be talking this morning about forms of contracts of employment for startups or new businesses. Ideally, we want to focus on those uh, entities that employ uh, 10 or less uh, employees. Contrary to popular belief, uh, the labor relations environment uh, within South Africa is not as restrictive as uh, to businesses as uh, has been made out uh, historically. We compete with uh, some of the best in the world. A large number of uh, European countries as well have much more restrictive labor laws uh, than us. The restrictive nature of uh, labor laws in South Africa is a misnomer and sort of a boogeyman as to how to deal with employment law. So if you have started to, if you've started an organization and now you wish to employ uh, employees, you have one of the first things you need to consider is what sort of relationship is going to govern me and my employees. The first relationship that I'd like to discuss is what is called an independent contractor relationship. If one uses an independent contractor relationship, one is not bound by the provisions of the Labor Relations Act. And it is for this reason that a number of organizations attempt to use this in order to remove themselves from the ambit of the Labor Relations Act. And um, as a result of that, they don't need to comply with the employment laws. However, the relationship is not one that is truly a independent contractor relationship. So what is an independent contractor relationship? An independent contractor relationship is a relationship which is dependent on the nature of the services that are rendered by the individual. The person is not subject, is not part of the fabric of, of the organization you as the company or as the employer do not have the authority to tell the individual what time he or she may come to work. All you are interested in is a product or a result or a service. The person is not, uh, is not provided with medical aid, pension fund. Uh, you have no control over who actually does the work for you. So by way of example, it is a relationship that you have with your electrician, alternatively with your plumber. So those are, or your driver. In those examples that I've provided, the driver, the electrician, the plumber, you do not have a right to tell the, uh, the entity or the individual whether they can work for other organizations. So they can do a piece of work for you as well as any other uh, entity. What a number of organizations try and do is to say that somebody is an independent contractor when in fact they are truly not. In this regard, they want to dictate to the individual what time he or she must come to work, how the work must be done, when must the work be done. These are not uh, tenants of a typical independent contract relationship. 
So what are the examples of a typical uh, employment relationship? Example one would be, which we are all uh, accustomed to, is a permanent contract of employment. This is somebody that works for you on a permanent basis. They are not entitled to work for any other organization. They are only entitled to work for you. This is what we are normally accustomed to uh, within South Africa, and we'll deal with what pieces of legislation governs them, how much leave and sick leave they are entitled to. The next sort of contract is what is called a fixed term contract of employment. This is a contract of employment where the person is employed for a limited duration based on a particular activity. So if you have an increase in your workload and you need somebody to come and assist you, you employ the person on a fixed term contract. Alternatively, if you wish to train somebody for a vocational period, vocational training, you will then employ that particular person for uh, that particular period of time. Alternate, uh, further alternatively, if the person has retired and you wish to employ somebody for, for a period after the retirement, those are all justifiable reasons uh, to employ um, the individual. The next contract is what is termed a part-time contract of employment. A part-time contract of employment is somebody who works less hours than a permanent full-time employee, so the person is remunerated on an hourly basis. Somebody that works, so that's the third one. The fourth one is somebody that works less than 24 hours a month, that person is not covered, is not regarded as an employee uh, and is not covered by the various pieces of uh, labor legislation. Historically, uh, people talk about casual employees. There is no such thing in employment law as a casual employee. That is a term that was used under the 1956 uh, Labor Relations Act that was prior to the advent of democracy. So therefore, there is nothing called a casual employee. So having set out the, the various types of employment agreements, let us now talk about which pieces of legislation govern these employees. The primary pieces of legislation are the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And this legislation sets out the minimum, and the emphasis is the word minimum, benefits which an employee is entitled to. If you provide an employee additional rights to that set out by the Basic Conditions of Employment Act that is not governed by uh, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. The next piece of legislation is the Labor Relations Act. And this act deals with, for small businesses, This act deals with small businesses and ex explains how you terminate an employee's employment. We have a question which says, can I hire a permanent employee and only pay them on a commission basis? And the answer is, yes, you may. So the person is only remunerated on the basis of what they bring in. A hallmark of employment law is not money that you pay. 
It's the fact that a person renders services to you. You can pay the person in money or in kind. The way that you pay them is not, uh, is not prescribed. So you can pay the employee to say that you are a salesperson. You will be entitled to leave, uh, sick leave and the like. However, you will only be remunerated based on the sales that you um, bring in to the organization. So moving on, the Labor Relations Act will then determine how you terminate an employee's employment, and that's uh, the one component. The second part of the Labor Relations Act deals with trade unions and the like, but if you are a startup in a small organization with less than 10 employees, that particular section does not become relevant. The ancillary employment laws, which I'm sure you would have dealt with from a tax perspective, is the unemployment insurance fund, which you would have to contribute to, the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, which is COIDA, which you would have to register with the Compensation Commission, and that deals with injuries at work, which you would have to register with the Skills Development Act. Um, and we then have the Employment Equity Act, which prohibits discrimination uh, generally, but if you're a startup, that piece of legislation would not impact directly on you. So let's deal, let's unpack the basic conditions of Employment Act. As indicated, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act deals with the minimum rights employees are entitled to. And what are the minimum rights that employees are entitled to? One, employees are only required to work 45 hours a week. Anything over and above working 45 hours per week, you are required to pay that employee overtime. Now, what is overtime? Overtime means you have a set standard of 45 hours and any time over and above that, well, they are working additional hours and the legislation sets out a formula for how much you are required to pay or benefit the employee. So for overtime, you would need to pay the employee at one and a half times the hourly rate they would have been paid uh, as a permanent employee. Alternatively, you may give the employee a day off or an hour and a half off for each hour which the employee works. It is important that your contract of employment expressly states that the employee agrees, that the employee agrees to work overtime. If your contract of employment does not state that the employee agrees to work overtime, you are unable to force the employee to work overtime. So there must be consent obtained up front. The next, those are the working hours. If an employee works on a Sunday, you must pay that employee double their hourly rate. And this is irrelevant to whether the employee usually works on a Sunday or not. So you would see that employees that work at some of our retail stores over the weekends on Sundays, you would have to pay that employee double their normal rate. Having, sought, having dealt with the issue of hourly rates, let's talk about what leave entitlements employees are entitled to. There is a question which says, can I ask my employee to work overtime without expecting them to claim overtime? You are unable to request your employee to work overtime without expecting them to claim. 
even if they do because of job scarcity, they are entitled to refer a complaint to the Department of Labor or the Department of Labor may on their own come and inspect whether you are complying with an employee's basic rights as such. So let's talk about annual leave. Employees who are employed on a permanent contract are entitled to 21 calendar days, which equals to approximately 15 working days leave per annum. That leave must be taken within six months of the end of the leave cycle. So by way of example, if the employee is employed on the 1st of January 2019, the employee is obliged to take their leave by no later than 20 June, sorry, by 30 June 2020. You are required to remind the employee to take their leave if after having um, if after having reminded them to take their leave and they do not, they will forfeit their leave. That is quite an important thing. In order for the employee to forfeit their leave, you must remind them. If you prevent them from taking their leave, they do not forfeit the leave. What happens with employees who do not work a full year? If an employee works on an hourly basis, that employee is entitled to one hour for, e for every 17 hours worked. Let me repeat that. If an employee like a part-time employee works on an hourly basis, that employee is entitled to one hour for every 17 hours he or she works. What happens to our fixed term employees who do not work a full year, but probably works for six months or eight months? That employee is entitled to one hour, sorry, one day for every 17 days work. So let's recap. A permanent employee who works on a full year is entitled to 21 calendar days, which equals to approximately 15 working days. A fixed term employee who doesn't work a full year is entitled to one day for every 17 days worked. And somebody that works on an hourly basis is entitled to one hour for every 17 hours worked. The next thing that we will deal with is how much sick leave is an employee entitled to. The employee is entitled to 36 days sick leave within a three-year cycle. It is possible that in, year, in the first year, after a period of a time, the employee can take all 36 days, and therefore that employee has exhausted their sick leave for the entire period. Obviously, the employee must bring a valid medical certificate to justify their sick leave. The fact that an employee submits a sick leave note does not mean that you are required to continue employing the person. If the employee is really ill, you may, in terms of the Labor Relations Act, terminate that employee's employment after following a fair process based on ill health, which we will deal with shortly. Now, what are you required to provide to an employee when you pay him or her? You must provide that employee with a pay slip which shows 
the name, surname, their designation, how many days or hours or, day, uh, or months that they've worked and for what period, as well as what deductions are you uh, making towards his or her salary. Now, you would have all heard about what is called the national minimum wage. The national minimum wage, if you calculate it, is 20 rands per hour. There is a question before we deal with the minimum wage. Somebody asked, if I have someone who comes in twice a week for only a few hours, am I required to pay? Pay as you earn, etc. If the person works less than 24 hours a month, then in those circumstances, that person is not regarded, is not covered by the basic conditions of Employment Act, and therefore it is unlikely that you would have had to uh, deduct pay as you earn UIF and the like. You would not have to provide that person with a, uh, you would not have to provide that person with annual leave or sick leave because they are not regarded as employees for the purposes of the basic conditions of Employment Act. If the person works more than 24 hours a month, so it's 24 or more hours a month, that person is regarded as an employee for the purposes of the basic conditions of Employment Act and therefore has all the rights that I've already mentioned. Coming back to the written particulars of employment, you, you should ideally be providing the employee with a payslip. The payslip does not need to be anything fancy, even if it is written down, you, uh, you can uh, write it down and provide it to the employee. Now, in your workplace, you should have an extract of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, which sets out employees' fundamental rights those extracts can be downloaded from the Department of Labor's website, which is labor.gov.za, or the CCMA's website, which is www.ccma.org.za. These two websites have a host of helpful tips, have templates of contracts of employment um, and the like. Now, what happens, how, what sort of notice do you need to provide your employees with before terminating their services? It is important to note that even though there is a notice period, you cannot, and I emphasize the word, you cannot terminate employees' employment without following a fair process. There is a question, when am I required to submit the tax deducted from my employees every month? Uh, I'm not a tax expert, but my understanding is that that must be submitted on a monthly basis. You have to pay the payers you earn over to uh, SARS, that's the South African Revenue Service as well as paying over the UIF and uh, the skills development levy. But usually when you register with SARS, that the South African Revenue Service, they will inform you whether you need to submit it monthly, quarterly, uh, or annually. Now, let us determine how do you terminate an employee's employment. Somebody that is on probation, you can place your employees on probation, but you must say what is the period of the probationary period. Probationary period means the time period during which you want to assess whether that person is suitable. If you wish to terminate an employee's employment during the probationary period, 
and that employee works for less for three months or less you can terminate that employee's employment by providing that employee with one week's notice it is imperative that before terminating that employee's employment you go through a fair process in under south african law you can only terminate an employee's employment on three grounds one is misconduct which means that the employee stole or was negligent two the employee is not performing or is ill and the third one is if you want to retrench the person after having followed a fair process the employee must be provided with notice, ideally. And the employee is usually provided with a month's notice uh, for termination. The question is, I heard that there is no such thing as a regular three-month probationary period anymore. Is this true? No, it is not. You are able to place somebody on probationary period for three months, four months, two months, six months in order to assess the person's performance. However, before terminating the employee's employment based on a probationary period, you must follow a fair process, which we are going to be dealing with in a moment. Now, if you wish to terminate somebody's employment because of misconduct so they stole or because they ill so somebody that's uh, sickly or because they're not performing you must have you must follow a process now a number of people or a number of institutions have said that you need to go through a formal process by holding by incurring the cost of appointing an external person by appointing the cost of lawyers and the like that is incorrect the Labor Relations Act does not require businesses to hold hearings like a criminal trial, like you're going to court. All you need to do is to place the allegations to the employee, allow the employee to make representations, and based on their representations, you can take a decision. Our courts do not expect you to adopt a criminal method when disciplining your employees, especially when you are a small business. We must add some sort of flexibility in disciplining our employees, provided we act fairly. So the CCM, if an employee is dismissed and challenges his or her dismissal, they usually go to the CCMA the CCMA will ask you what was the reason you fired the employee and what process did you follow. And the process, if you followed a process whereby you told the employee, and these are the allegations against you, you stole on this date, this is the information, and you've seriously considered the employee's representations and you've made a decision it is unlikely that the ccma will find that you followed an unfair process but i must emphasize that one if you fire somebody or if you terminate their employment please ensure that you have a good reason it is not a good reason to simply say i'm firing you because i don't like you I'm firing you because of your hair or some personal characteristic. It must be something objective where you have sufficient bases to fire the particular individual. Now, let's go back to the basic conditions of Employment Act and recap. We've dealt with what is called the written particulars of employment, which you should provide the employee with. You should provide him with the leave, sick leave, and overtime. Now, the question is, does the Basic Conditions of Employment Act prescribe what are your opening and closing times of your business? The answer is no, it does not. All it says is that employees must not be required to work 
for more than 45 hours a week. You can determine how those 45 hours a week are allocated. It could be Monday to Friday. It could be Monday to Saturday. It could be from 9 to 5, 8 to 4. The time, the opening and closing times are within your discretion. Employees must be provided with at least one hour lunch, which is unpaid, or 30 minutes, which is you can reduce the one hour lunch to 30 minutes. The one hour lunch is an unpaid uh, period. In addition to that, should employees be given smoke breaks? No, the law does not prescribe that employees should be given smoke breaks. That is an indulgence which you provide to your employees. Should employees be given tea breaks? No, the law does not prescribe that employees should be given a tea break. That is something that you provide to the employees as an indulgence. Does the Basic Conditions of Employment Act say that you must provide employees with medical aid? No, the law does not state that you must provide the employees with a medical aid or a pension fund. If you do, that is part of the remuneration. Does the law state that you must provide the employee with a travel allowance or a vehicle or a vehicle allowance? No, it does not. These are all indulgences that are provided by you to your employee. And companies do that to either make, to attract the good employees. Now, there is what is called a threshold. What is a threshold? This is the amount of money that is determined by the Minister of Labor on an annual basis, and it is used to calculate various aspects. The amount at current is 205,433 rands and some odd. If you earn above this amount, which I'm sure that none of our small startups uh, would be paying employees that amount, a number of the provisions of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act do not apply. But I am assuming that most of our organizations and people on this chat uh, earn employees below that. The question is, what are the basic requirements I am obliged to provide to my employees? By this, I, I interpret this question is, what is the bare minimum that I am required to provide my employees with? All you need to do is to provide your employees with remuneration. It can either be commission or on a monthly basis or the like. The minimum is 20 rands per hour. That's all. You do not need to provide them with medical aid, housing, pension fund vehicle, all of those are ancillary. If you wish to provide them with those, those are just added on to their, to their remuneration. As a startup, all you need to do is to provide them with money. In addition to that, uh, we've dealt with it, you provide them with leave, annual leave, sick leave, and the like. So coming back to, we've dealt with the issue of meal intervals. We've dealt with the issue of how much you need to pay your employees. We dealt with the issue of sick leave. And we've dealt with the issue of termination. The question is, and you would have heard what is called maternity, which is for women and paternity, which is for men. <coughs> the law regarding paternity for men is not yet in force. So men are not entitled to any leave on the birth of their child. 
they are only entitled to what is called family responsibility leave, which is three days per annum <clears throat> for the birth of their child or the death of a, uh, of a parent or a grandparent. And the law is still being enacted regarding paternity leave and indications are that it should happen before year end. In respect of maternity leave, an employee, a female employee is entitled to six months maternity leave. However, the maternity leave is unpaid. The employees who wish to go on maternity leave are required to claim for the maternity period from the unemployment insurance fund. So therefore, if somebody goes on maternity leave, you are not required to pay that employee any monies. You cannot fire somebody because they are on maternity leave. If you do, that will be a serious transgression, which we will deal with in a moment. Now, Family responsibility leave is applicable to both um, to both male and females. So let's look at the various categories of leave now. We've dealt with annual leave, we've dealt with sick leave, and now we have family responsibility leave, which is three days per annum. The question is, what are the possible legislative changes regarding paternity leave? Paternity leave uh, will entitle the employer, will entitle male employees to go and leave on the birth of the child. Uh, and I'll come back to you in a moment as to how many days it changes uh, continuously as to how long employees may actually go on uh, paternity leave. I will come back to you in terms of the latest amendments as to how many months uh, fathers will be entitled to uh, paternity leave. Um, the, the reason uh, it is uh, it says you are entitled, uh, sorry, just bear with me for a moment. Good, I will revert to that. Can I then, while I'm coming back to that question, just, uh, sorry. It will be working South African dads will be entitled to the latest says 10 days of paternity leave after their birth of their children. So they will be entitled to only uh, 10 days uh, paternity leave. Let's talk about dismissals and firing employees. If you terminate uh, an employee's employment because of their race, gender, sexual orientation, or because they are on maternity, paternity leave, and the law says that that is prohibited, and if you do so, the employee will be able to lodge a claim against you equal to two years of their salary. If you lodge a, if you fire them for general misconduct, like if they stole or because they are not performing adequately and you are found to be, to have been incorrect in that you didn't have a good reason or you didn't follow a fair process. So you walk into the person's office and you say you are fired. The maximum amount you will be entitled to claim will be an amount of one year's remuneration or the person may be required to come to be returned to re be reinstated back into your uh, organization i may mention that for various startups it may not be possible to phone a lawyer or a labor consultant 
the CCMA offers free guidance to you before uh, to, to guide you through the process alternatively on your website uh, sorry on the on the internet there are various law firms that have offered guidance as to how to terminate or how to deal with employees should you wish to terminate now the next question that i've been asked is if May I ask you a question regarding national minimum wage? If I understand you correctly, you stated that the person may be remunerated on a commission basis only. What will then resort under the exclusion when you calculate in terms of section five of the national minimum wage? Now, let's just talk about the national minimum wage. The question is, can I be, uh, Sorry, I'm just getting a copy of the act up because the question was in relation to section five so that I can just uh, refer the, uh, actually quote the section to all our participants. And as it's downloading, let's just talk about the national minimum wage. The national minimum wage is the minimum amount of money you need to pay to your employees uh, and this is not in the domestic sector um, indications are that the national minimum wage will be increased uh, during the course of this year uh, the courts uh, sorry the government is in the process of actually uh, reviewing that uh, as we speak i'm just downloading the national minimum wage and i will uh, answer the question in a moment so carrying on the uh, what happens why would you want why is it required to pay employees the national minimum wage the reason you want to pay the reason government has implemented a national minimum wage is because it is of the view that that is the minimum amount of money that will sustain uh, employees given the current uh, environment that they are in. And it's been through quite a rigorous process. Uh, it's been through quite a rigorous process in its determination. I'm going to answer the question uh, about the national minimum wage in a moment. So we have about 20 minutes uh, left. Let's deal with uh, other ancillary issues uh, that uh, may arise. What happens if a startup organization wishes to employ employees who are not South African citizens? And in order for you to employ any foreign national that foreign national must have that foreign national must have a work permit if the foreign national does not have a work permit you are exposing yourself to a potential uh, to potential civil liability, uh, sorry, uh, sp criminal liability, so that the Department of uh, Labor may lodge a claim against you and fine you and the like as such. What happens if you wish to terminate a foreign national's uh, employment? despite the person not having a work permit despite the person not having a work permit that person still remains your employee you are still required to follow a fair process uh, when terminating that person's uh, employment as such so you cannot say 
because you are a foreign national, I'm not going to give you leave. Or because you're a foreign national, I'm not going to comply with the uh, basic conditions of employment act or the national minimum wage. You are required to still treat that person fairly and that's the beauty of our uh, labor dispensation. Now, just to answer the question, Jacques, uh, question, uh, we're still downloading, but the national minimum wage purpose was to provide uh, for a national wage in order to assist and guide uh, individuals regarding uh, how much to pay to its employees. Now, Jacques raised the issue in relation to section five, which we are just getting down. It's taking a bit slower than usual to download the legislation at the moment. I'm sorry, I don't have that uh, readily available. Good. If we now just talk a bit about the why is it why is it not required that we provide employees with medical aid and the like, the law that the law doesn't believe that that sort of we, we should burden uh, organizations uh, in relation uh, to imposing upon them the burden of medical aid uh, and the like as such. Can we just talk a bit about what does it mean to sorry just um, I'm just trying to download still. Seems to be winning here. Yeah? I know there's a bit of a dead spot, but uh, the, the, the next question is, where do employees for small businesses lodge their disputes? They are entitled to lodge their disputes at the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, or if you are in a sector which is governed by what is called a bargaining council, uh, then in those circumstances, it has to be referred to the bargaining council as such. Uh, so for argument, uh, a way of example, there is a bargaining council for the road freight industry. You can't use the CCMA. Your employees have to refer it to the bargaining council. Uh, it's finally downloaded. Can I then just read for the benefit of all the listeners, what does section five of the national minimum wage says, and I apologize for taking so long. Uh, you should uh, consider reading the piece of legislation which is available on the uh, internet. It says, despite any contract or law to the contrary, the calculation of a wage for the purpose of this act is the amount payable in money for ordinary hours of work, excluding any payment made to enable a worker to work, including any transport, equipment, tool, food, or accommodation allowance unless specified otherwise in a sectoral determination, any payment made in kind, any gratuities, any other prescribed bases. And then it says, subject to subsection 2, if the worker is paid on a basis other than the number of hours worked, and that would be a commission hour, 
the worker may not be paid less than the national minimum wage for the ordinary hours of work. What that means is that a worker may be paid only on commission, but if you need to ensure that the at the very least that the worker is paid at 20 rands uh, per hour for the work for the hours that he or she has worked. So the way that I've the way that we have advised our clients is there has to be a base pay of uh, 20 rands uh, per hour. Uh, as such, so that's the, so you start off with a base pay of twenty rands, and then the commission that they earn, whatever it is, you just simply deduct it uh, from that uh, annual amount. So I trust that that uh, answers Jacques' uh, question. Good. And I, I, I think that we've covered. Uh, everything that I would like to cover in terms of the forms of the employment contract, what are the basic provisions that are provided to an employee, and how can an employee challenge, uh, how can an employee challenge those. I wish you good luck with your business ventures, and I hope uh, this was helpful. Before I close off, I would take any final questions if you have any in the next minute or so. So I'll just keep quiet for a minute and see if there's any questions. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Good afternoon.